So I'd like to thank you all for coming today. Um, my name is Steve Matai, and I'm a pulmonologist at Johns Hopkins. Um, I'm chair of this session along with uh, Colleen McAvoy and Chris Archichico, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves to you in a second. But I just want to welcome you all and uh, talk a bit about the goals of this session, which are listed in your, in your handout. But essentially what we'd like to do is um, make sure that we all leave the room with a good understanding of connective tissue diseases and how they might contribute to uh, pulmonary hypertension and what that means in terms of how we approach patients in the evaluation and treatment of pulmonary hypertension. Um, so just a couple ground rules. What we're going to do is each of us is going to get up and give a little eight to ten minute um, talk about a particular topic within what I just described to you. After each of those um, talks, we'll ask for questions related to that particular topic. Um, and we, hopefully by the end of the three talks, we'll have hit all your major question areas. We may ask for you to hold your question if it's not directly related to the particular topic that we're discussing at the time, because we'll be addressing it later on, okay? Um, so uh, hopefully we can have a good interactive session. And with that, um, I'll have Chris come up, introduce herself, and uh, start her talk. Good afternoon. I'm Chris archer Chico. I'm a nurse practitioner from the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Um, and Steve has asked me to give a little overview and describe the different um, types of connective tissue disease. Um, so I wanted to start to say connective tissues are tissues that connect, support, and separate um, our tissues and organs. They're actually made up of two proteins, collagen and elastin. Collagen is found in tendons, ligaments, skin, and cartilage. Elastin is more rubbery, almost like a rubber band, um, and it's found in ligaments and skin. When a patient has connective tissue disease, the collagen and elastin are inflamed, and that occurs as a result of abnormal immune system activity. Okay, sorry. Um, so the definition is of connective tissue diseases. It's a, a diverse group of chronic systemic diseases characterized by immune-mediated organ damage, meaning the immune system is kind of out of control and it's causing organ damage. There's a variety of different clinical features and there's presence of circulating antibodies. Lung disease is common in these patients, and some of the disorders will lead to pulmonary hypertension, and I'm going to identify that for you today. So I'm going to go over about six different types of connective tissue disease. There's others. Um, I'm going to be very brief because we have limited time today. But the first is lupus. Lupus is a multi-system disease affecting blood vessels, kidneys, brain, skin, heart, the GI tract, the muscular skeletal system, and lungs. And these patients have episodes of inflammation. For patients, different tissues and organs are inflamed in different people, and the severity ranges. It could be mild to very severe um, where patients need to be admitted. Um, so these patients have flares. It occurs between 14 to 78 per persons in 100,000, and it is more common in women, about 10 times more common. Some of the general symptoms is they can have fevers, joint inflammation and pain, fatigue, skin rashes. They get like a butterfly rash over the face. Um, they can have sensitive skin to light where they get sunburn easily and they get rashes. They can have problems with fluid around the lungs or heart. They can have kidney problems, low blood counts. Um, they can have nerve or brain damage or dysfunction. Rheumatoid arthritis is the second one, and this is the most common type um, out in the community, um, the most common arthritis. This is where the immune system attacks tissues that line the joints. It causes joint pain and swelling and stiffness. And over time, the rheumatoid arthritis can damage bone and cartilage. It affects the joints, and it also causes muscle weakness um, with, and affects the ligaments and the tendons. So usually this starts with the small joints of the hands and the feet, but it can affect other joints. It can affect the lungs, the lining around the lungs, causing what we call pleurisy. 
It can affect the lining around the heart, which we call pericarditis, and also the lining around blood vessels, which we call vasculitis. This typically occurs in women, again, 75% more than men. About 1.3 million Americans are affected, and this starts in middle age, 40s to 60s. So the symptoms then are pain, stiffness, problems using the joints, um, swelling, and, and again, patients have limited, limited joint motion. So the third one I'm going to speak about is Sjogren's. Sjogren's is a chronic inflammatory condition characterized by excessive dryness of the eyes, mouth, and mucous membranes. Um, this happens to about um, 10 times as many women as men. Um, the symptoms vary, but most of these patients are able to lead a pretty normal lifestyle. Um, the symptoms that they have are irritated dry eyes, dry mouth and throat. Many have problems with swallowing. They have dry nasal passages. They can develop more complications such as dental decay, gum infection, um, and having the dry um, nasal passages and throat, they're more susceptible to infections such as pneumonia. So um, symptoms uh, also include arthritis, pericarditis, and rashes, numbness, tingling, and muscle weakness. The next one I'm gonna speak about is polymyositis and dermatomyositis. So polymyositis is characterized by painful inflammation and degeneration of muscles. Dermatomyositis is also the same painful inflammation and degeneration of muscles, but it also is accompanied by skin inflammation. This happens to middle-aged adults. The cause, again, is unknown. This is a more disabling disease where patients have very severe muscle weakness. It, effective, it actually typically affects the shoulders and the hips, and it will affect the joints um, and muscles symmetrically. So the patients have a lot of muscle and joint pain. They have Raynaud's, they have rash, difficulty swallowing, they have fevers, fatigue, weight loss. And with the dermatomyositis that has the skin um, involvement, they get a red rash on their face. They have um, characteristic reddish, purplish swelling around their eyes and a rash on their knuckles. And when this rash fades, it becomes replaced by more brown pigmented skin. Um, so that is dermatomyositis and polymyositis. The next is mixed connective tissue disease. And this is actually an overlap of systemic sclerosis, of lupus, and polymyositis. 80% um, of people with this disease are women, so women are more affected by these disorders. Um, these patients have Raynaud's, the joint aches, the arthritis, swollen hands, muscle weakness, difficulty swallowing, heartburn, shortness of breath. Regardless of how this disease starts, it tends to worsen and spread to other parts of the body. Our big focus today is going to be on systemic sclerosis because that is the more common of the connective tissue diseases. This affects about 75,000 to 100,000 people in the U.S., again, four times more common in women. Um, and there's two types. There's limited, which is known as the Crest syndrome, and then there's more systemic. So for the Crest, I want to describe what the letters stand for, C-R-E-S-T. The, the C stands for calcinosis or calcium deposits in the skin. The R is for Raynaud's, which is um, poor circulation in the fingers, where the fingers are very sensitive to cold, and they become also dusky and reddened. E is esophageal dysfunction. Um, patients who have problems um, having the food travel down their esophagus or food tube. Um, sclerodactyl is um, skin damage on the fingers. They're kind of swollen and very thickened skin, um, the kind of sausage-like fingers. And then telangiectasias are spider veins on the um, face or skin. The diffuse and systemic type is definitely having more or internal organ involvement. Um, we see much more um, interstitial lung disease. We see these patients have kidney disease, more serious problems with the GI tract, 
and even some heart issues. So symptoms um, are very thickened, taut skin. Again, more of that collagen, um, you know, thickening and, and changing the skin. Patients can sometimes um, have a small oral cavity or small mouth. Um, talked about the spider veins. They have stiff joints, scarring of the esophagus, the um, gastric reflux. They have problems with um, absorbing nutrients and medications and they also have weight loss. With the lungs, there's also scarring that moves to the lungs and develops interstitial lung disease, making these patients more hypoxemic, more short of breath. Um, they also can develop pulmonary hypertension. Kidney damage can also occur as the patient develops um, advanced systemic hypertension. So again, much more internal organ involvement. Now the risk of pulmonary hypertension of these conditions with respect to lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and Sjogren's, it's actually about 1% of the patients will move on to develop pulmonary hypertension, so not that common. Polymyositis and dermatomyositis, these patients may develop pulmonary hypertension. Mixed connective tissue disease, they definitely have a high prevalence of pulmonary arterial hypertension, up to 65%. So these patients, it's recommended that they get screening. And also systemic sclerosis, um, they definitely develop um, pulmonary arterial hypertension and, and require screening. So the screening that's recommended for patients with the conditions that are likely to progress into pulmonary hypertension, that screening should be done annually. And the reason is that we want to have early diagnosis and early intervention. So it's recommended that patients have a multidisciplinary approach with a collaborative health team. Because of the multiple chronic health issues that affect the many organs and body systems. So just briefly, I'm going to mention them again. Patients have a lot of fatigue, a lot of muscle and joint pain that actually makes them disabled. Um, they're at risk for falls, um, needing help um, uh, with assistive devices and maybe physical therapy. There's a lot of GI issues with um, the swallowing and absorbing the medications. Um, and weight loss. There's also renal problems. There are the severe skin issues. When the patients develop severe Raynaud's, they can get infections um, in their open, small open areas at the ends of their fingertip. And the worsening interstitial lung disease can be quite severe and progressive. So they need followed for that with higher oxygen and maybe thick medications like steroids and immunosuppressants to turn down that immune system. So the team um, that sh is recommended is definitely based on your conditions, but a rheumatology person should be involved, a pH specialist and nurses, pulmonologist, cardiologist, gastroenterologist, a kidney specialist, maybe a psychiatrist or psychologist to help with some depression and anxiety, and patient, people like physical therapists, occupational therapists, dietitians, social work can also help um, to get you the uh, um, assistance that you need. And then there's also support groups out there for help. I know you know PHA, but there's also the Scleroderma Foundation and the Lupus Foundation. So um, I'm going to turn it over now to, Great. oh, you want questions? Thank you. Yeah, so um, thank you, Chris. Uh, any questions about just the overview? I know Chris went over a lot of information here, but um, well, let me ask one question first of the audience. Who's been told they have a connective tissue disease, like Chris mentioned? Okay. All right, good. Um, so let's start with some questions. Hold on one second. There's a microphone coming to you. Is there a reason why these diseases all affect women more so than men? Do they connect it to hormonal things, or is there any explanation? I don't think we know that right now. Yeah. It seems like almost every disease that I've ever had <laughs> is directed toward women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think in general men are weaker, so you know, <laughs> we, we wouldn't be able to deal with it. But question in the back there? Or? Um, I just wanted to know, I think that, well, I have 
both the crests, I have four out of five, and I guess it's the systemic because it's interfered now, giving me pulmonary hypertension. Is there any difference in the treatment between the two, or it's basically the same treatment? So to be clear, your question is, you believe you have crest yeah, I have and have that you have um, pulmonary hypertension. So what does that mean in terms of treatment? Yes. Okay. okay. Um, so uh, I'll take that. Okay. okay. Um, so the, the, the thing to, um, although Chris nicely outlined the way we define scleroderma, for instance, there's a lot of overlap between what the manifestations are, what organs are affected. I think sometimes it's confusing because we have so many different terminologies for these particular diseases, but I think the key thing is to understand which organs are involved. Um, one, of the, one way that's, that's helpful to distinguish between limited or the crest form and diffuse scleroderma is the extent of skin involvement. So that's, that's helpful. So if you have skin involvement that's above the elbows and above the knees, most scleroderma patients have skin involvement from the elbow down. But if you have skin involvement on your trunk, on your chest, or on your thighs, then it's most likely you have diffuse scleroderma. If it's distal to your elbows, lower than your knees, it's most likely um, uh, limited. Okay, so um, that doesn't really impact how treatment. We'll talk about that treatment later, but it doesn't really impact treatment unless there's involvement of the lung tissue rather than the lung blood vessels. And that's a fine point that Colleen will talk about as well. Yes. Hi, yes, I was diagnosed with mixed connective tissue disease about six years ago, and then within three months I was told I had pulmonary hypertension. I was just put on Plaquenil for the mixed connective tissue disease and nothing else was done for that. They said that the pulmonary hypertension was more serious to deal with. Are there any other treatments out there? Should I be more concerned about the mixed connective tissue disease? It doesn't seem to be acting up in any way. Mm -hmm. Could you ask? I'm, I'm happy to answer. So, um, well, there's, there's two things I think that you're asking is one is how to treat the, the mixed connective tissue disease and then the other is, is the pulmonary hypertension. And really those are treated separately in a way is the pulmonary hypertension is, is treated with the, the 14 drugs that we have available right now with the pulmonary hypertension specific medications. The mixed connective tissue disease um, can vary depending on the, the involvement of your other organs. And that's really kind of individualized and uh, really kind of up to the, the rheumatologist. There, if there is specific lung involvement at, at the, the lung tissue level, then there may be you know, more therapy that um, could be initiated. But it really depends on the specific organ involvement. And that's individu individualized for each person. Yeah, I would add that um, the, the where the disease is affecting is very important. So for instance, in patients with scleroderma, they sometimes get involvement of their muscles. They get myositis, which is just means a fancy word for inflammation of the muscles. And in that situation, scleroderma patients might benefit from immunosuppressive therapies, not necessarily steroids, but met other medications that might help with the inflammation part. And each of the individual diseases that were mentioned, lupus, mixed connective tissue disease, it's, uh, those other diseases, when they're active, there may be a role for immunosuppression, but if, there's, if they're not active, then you don't necessarily need treatment. That's a general rule. It's not, your specific case might be different, but in general, that's, that's the thought. Okay, maybe we'll let Colleen uh, give her uh, presentation and then we'll have questions there. Okay. Hi, I'm Colleen McAvoy. I'm a pulmonologist at Washington University in St. Louis. So I'm going to go over really the different forms of pulmonary hypertension. All of you who are sitting here have pulmonary hypertension, presumably, and um, it looks like the majority of you have connective tissue disease. We talked to, Chris talked about the different organ involvement, and when we look at pulmonary hypertension, really pulmonary hypertension just means that high pressures on the right side of the heart. And there are five different forms of pulmonary hypertension. And so many of you had to go through the different workup to figure out what type of pulmonary hypertension do you have because then therapy is based on what type you have. 
So the World Health Organization, like I said, broke it into five different categories. The first category is what we consider pulmonary arterial hypertension, PAH. And that includes most of the forms of connective tissue disease, where there is a problem at the blood vessel level in the lungs. And that causes the, the vessels to become abnormal and higher pressures um, that then lead into the right side of the heart. About 30% of all patients who have this group one pulmonary arterial hypertension have connective tissue disease. And so that's why it's very important to find out what type you have. Then type two is looking at the left side of the heart. The left side of the heart can have problems with pumping or systolic dysfunction. It can also have problems with relaxation. And particularly in patients with scleroderma and some other forms of connective tissue disease, they have more thickness and stiffening of the left side of the heart that doesn't allow the heart to completely relax. Well, and if you think about if you were blowing up a balloon and it became thicker and stiffer, it would be harder to blow up and you have less air inside that balloon. It's the same thing with the left side of the heart and you get less filling of the blood and that blood then kind of backs up onto the right side of the heart and elevates the pressures. When we're also looking at the left side of the heart, we look at the valves. The valves can become abnormal and that can again cause some dysfunction that leads to high pressures. The third group, group three, is looking at lung disease. And as was mentioned, some forms of connective tissue disease have a higher incidence of what we call interstitial lung disease. And really that means a problem at the lung tissue level. And it can be due to fibrosis or scarring of the lungs, and sometimes there can be um, abnormalities called bronchiolitis obliterans that uh, is more associated with rheumatoid arthritis. They can also cause problems with exhaling and that can make you short of breath. Not only does it make you short of breath, but it can also lead to higher pressures on the right side of the heart. Group four is chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, CTEF. So just really a big phrase to say there's blood clots in the lungs that are causing a backup of pressure. If you think about a pipe, or you think about plumbing, if you were to get something stuck in your pipe, that causes the back of a pressure into your sink. Well, and then you try and plunge it away and move away that clot or blockage, and that would help decrease the pressure. And that's exactly what we look at with chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. This is, in, they'll get more into treatment, but this is actually a potential curative form of pulmonary hypertension when the clots become removed. The fifth form of pulmonary hypertension is really kind of a grab bag. It's a kind of miscellaneous, but it becomes important in connective tissue disease because one of the features is chronic kidney disease. And we know with particularly scleroderma and lupus, there can be kidney involvement. And that kidney involvement is relatively unclear why it can cause pulmonary hypertension. It doesn't seem to be a very direct causal relationship, but we know that, um, that it can lead to pulmonary hypertension and that can make it a little bit more difficult to treat. So when we have these five forms, we want to figure out what form of pulmonary hypertension do you have, and that's where all the testing comes in. How many people had to go through just numerous tests and they were wondering why they had to go through those tests? Yes. Everybody should be raising their hands, right? <laughs> You wonder, why is my doctor putting me through all of this? I, don't, I feel terrible, I'm short of breath, I can't get around the hospital, these hospitals are huge. Why are they doing this? Well, we're really trying to figure out what is making you feel so short of breath, what is making you feel so tired? And so we first start out with some blood work. And that blood work also helps us determine um, some t forms of connective tissue disease. We look for specific markers in the blood that can give us clues to what type of connective tissue disease you have. So you probably had a lot of blood files drawn um, at the time of diagnosis. Um, seeing some head, head nods there. And, and the, that's why we do that, is to try and sort out what type of connective tissue disease it is. We also look at liver. We look at, is the liver working well? Because if the liver is not working well, 
it could be causing the pulmonary hypertension, and that's something we want to realize. And or in the kind of side part of that is if the liver's not working well and it's not causing it, is it because of the pulmonary hypertension the liver's not working well? So these are things that we want to know about. We then perform breathing tests. You know, all of you have gone through the pulmonary function lab to look at your breathing. And we try to determine is there something else causing the pulmonary hypertension like at the lung level, that group three disease. So is it interstitial lung disease? Is it related to COPD, emphysema? So we check your breathing tests. We also look to see, are there any signs of obstructive sleep apnea? I bet many of you underwent either a sleep study or had to have an overnight oximetry study where they check your oxygen overnight to see if your oxygen dropped down. And the reason that becomes really important is even if it's not the main cause of the pulmonary hypertension in that group three, it helps us treat the pulmonary hypertension. And we know that patients who get treated for their sleep apnea respond better to the medication. So that's an important feature of all this testing that we do. And then some of you also probably had a CT scan of their lungs. And that's to look for the fibrosis or scarring of the lungs to look to see if there's anything else like emphysema or this bronchiolitis obliterans. The other test that everyone should have is something called a VQ scan. And that's where we measure the blood flow and the ventilation of the lungs. And that looks for those chronic clots, the group four disease. Because like I said, if we find chronic clots, and particularly in patients who have lupus, who may have a, a tendency to clot more frequently, it can be potentially curative with surgery. And so that's why everyone underwent this VQ scan. Also, you underwent an echocardiogram. That's probably why you originally saw your pulmonologist or cardiologist anyway. So the importance of the echocardiogram is not just to signify that there's pulmonary hypertension there, but it looks at the left side of the heart. It looks for the valve. It looks at the valves. Was there valvular disease, mitral stenosis, or something else causing it? Also looking uh, at the pumping and the relaxation of the left side of the heart. Then uh, you probably also, um, the, or you needed to undergo a right heart catheterization. The right heart cath is the end kind of result of all of this previous testing that we do. And the reason it's the end, not the first study that we do, is because we can kind of tailor what we look at in the right heart cath based on all those previous tests that you just had. And so that's why we kind of put you through all of that initially is because we can order specific maneuvers with the right heart catheterization. And for those of you who don't no, exactly. The right heart catheterization is direct measurement of the pressures on the right side of the heart. And it also tells us how is the right heart functioning. Some other things that we can do and, and may be used either at diagnosis or at follow-up is a cardiac MRI. Has anybody had a cardiac MRI? So the cardiac MRI can also help look at the right heart function and that's something we tend to follow over time. And these are things that become very important because when you look at connective tissue disease that can affect the whole body and not just the vessels in the lungs, we want to sort out why do you feel short of breath. And sometimes it's not always a pulmonary hypertension. Sometimes it can be low blood counts from a slow leakage of blood from uh, problems in the gut due to scleroderma. And also, it can be due to weakness of the diaphragms, or even just, as Dr. Mathai mentioned, muscles become inflamed and it can be difficult to walk and that can make you feel short of breath. So we look for all these different markers to help guide our therapy and um, make that, that diagnosis. And it really does take the multidisciplinary team between rheumatologists, cardiologists, radiologists, and GI doctors sometimes too. Great. Thank you. So any questions about what Colleen has told us regarding the evaluation? Yes, sir. He's coming with the microphone. Is it possible to be in more than one group? Very good question. Um, I'm glad you're answering that question <laughs> instead of me. It is. Um, and we do see uh, patients who fall into this group one where there's problems at the blood vessel level due to their connective tissue disease 
and then um, more likely we see an association with the group three with the interstitial lung disease. And uh, management of that is, uh, well, it's, it's really right now based on more expert opinion than it is on um, trials. And um, that was part of our challenging cases actually today, look, talking about uh, how to treat and manage these patients. I think we're gaining more information, uh, but treating the ILD portion and then also treating the pulmonary hypertension uh, is, is you know, more. Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a very good point. And a lot of people can have, particularly connective tissue diseases, um, can have other manifestations, particularly with the heart. So in addition to the lung, um, the left ventricle it can be stiff, what we call diastolic dysfunction. And what Colleen was talking about, where the heart doesn't fill properly, it doesn't relax properly, and pressure gets back transmitted into the lungs. It's a very common scenario. Unfortunately, it's also associated with maturity. So if you're mature, you're likely to have a little bit of, uh, of uh, diastolic dysfunction as well. So um, it can be very challenging to separate those things out. And it's important because the therapies that are directed, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, that are directed to treat pulmonary arterial hypertension are, were uh, studied and developed for patients who didn't have problems with the lung tissue and didn't have problems with the left side of the heart. Um, and as a little anecdote, I will tell you that uh, all the medications, or I should say the majority of medications that are currently approved to treat PAH were first developed uh, with the idea of treating left heart failure. And none of them worked. And uh, uh, the reason uh, we became aware of the potential of these medications for pulmonary hypertension were that in certain scenarios, patients who had some degree of pulmonary hypertension felt better. And that led to the investigation. Well, maybe if we just look at patients with pulmonary hypertension who didn't have left heart disease, maybe those would be the patients who would respond. Um, I'll tell a little story about this as well. So um, sildenafil, the study that sildenafil was initially studied for left heart failure. And um, when uh, the study ended, which was a negative study, um, so it did not improve outcomes in, heart, in left heart failure, but when the study ended, the men in the study wouldn't give the pills back. <laughs> and uh, through that analysis, they realized the off-target effects of the medication, and hence Viagra was, was, uh, was born. <laughs> so uh, you know, these, these, these studies do tell us a lot, maybe not what we really want to learn, but they tell us other things. Um, so I think that's an interesting story. Any other questions about what Colleen Thank you. Asking? Sure. One second, sir. And my wife is uh, group one okay. and uh, was then um, also has uh, incomplete scleroderma. Um, does the kidney develop problems with incomplete scleroderma or is that only for complete? Limited, yeah. Limited. So um, the answer is specific cases, it's very difficult to comment on your case in particular, but in general, patients who have diffuse scleroderma are more likely to have kidney involvement. But that kidney involvement is, was described at the, at the conference at the luncheon today with the scleroderma renal crisis that's much more common in diffuse patients. But it's also unfortunately common in patients who receive high dose of steroids. So one of the things that's very important if you've been diagnosed with a connective tissue disease is to make sure that you've nailed down what you have. Um, because uh, as House says, you remember the TV show House, it's he always talks about lupus. Well, lupus is a very, it's much, much, much more common than scleroderma. If we look at the order of magnitude, rheumatoid arthritis is in 0.5% of the population. Um, lupus is about 75 per 100,000, and scleroderma is about 300 per million. Okay, so orders of magnitude of uh, differences in prevalence in the United States. Um, so, yes, people are going to think lupus before they think scleroderma, but lupus responds differently to steroids than patients who have scleroderma because when you have scleroderma, you're at higher risk of having scleroderma renal crisis when you get on high-dose steroids. Um, so I think kidney involvement, typically when we think about kidney involvement in scleroderma, we're worried about scleroderma renal crisis, but kidney involvement can occur also because the heart isn't working well. So you can get poor perfusion to the kidneys and that can cause kidney problems, and when you have underlying scleroderma, that might be more... Um, uh, apparent. Yes, in the back. Um, since there's no 
wonderful treatment for scleroderma, and that seems to be driving the pulmonary hypertension as a secondary cause. Um, are there any clinical trials that you're aware of, particularly for limited uh, scleroderma, that look to be promising in treating the underlying cause? Move right into your yeah, move. There. Thank you for that. That's a perfect segue. Um, so, treatment for scleroderma. I'm not aware of any studies that are looking at, at disease modifying therapies right now um, that are that are any anywhere beyond like phase two studies. So, um, uh, there's certain studies right now that are ongoing in, in I should say phase three study going on right now, looking at. Um, patients both with scleroderma and who have scleroderma and pulmonary hypertension because there's thought that this medication might be effective for both. Whether or not it works, we don't know yet. Um, and actually, I think it's only being studied in diffuse scleroderma, as I recall this particular drug that I'm thinking about. Um, no, it's not rituximab. No. Rituximab is being studied for pulmonary hypertension and scleroderma in all, all types. Okay, so I'll talk about therapy for pulmonary hypertension for a moment, and then we'll have to leave some time to talk about, to have, answer some more questions. So, um, as was nicely laid out by Colleen, we talked about the different types of pulmonary hypertension, and your treatment is really going to be based upon the type of pulmonary hypertension that you, you uh, end up having based upon this evaluation that we went through. So, I'm going to skip over group one. I'll come back to that at the end, because that's actually where we have the most information. And I'll talk about the other forms of pulmonary hypertension where it's kind of expert opinion slash what happened to the last patient I treated with, the, with this. Um, so for instance, group two patients, and commonly what we see in connective tissue diseases is patients who have um, diastolic dysfunction. There have been no studies showing benefit of treating pulmonary hypertension that is solely due to diastolic dysfunction. Um, there are problems with the studies that were done. Um, the, the design wasn't necessarily set up to look for patients who had pulmonary hypertension related to diastolic dysfunction. Um, they took all patients who have uh, diastolic dysfunction in, in the studies that have been done. Um, so we don't know if there's an effective therapy directly treating pulmonary hypertension and uh, diastolic dysfunction. What we do know is there are therapies that can help with the diastolic function of the heart, or we think they help with the diastolic function of the heart. And those include the general things that we would recommend for anybody. Get your blood pressure under very good control. Um, other things that are commonly associated with diastolic dysfunction include diabetes, hyperlipidemia, sleep apnea. So if you see your doctor, and they talk to you about these things. They're very important for the way the left heart works and for pulmonary hypertension. It's not just general health. It's for specific reasons regarding how the heart and lungs work. So there's very important things to address. The valvular function, typically patients develop pulmonary hypertension when it affects the mitral valve. So if the mitral valve is narrowed or leaky, then the left, uh, there can be back transmission of pressure into the lungs, and that can lead to pulmonary hypertension. If the aortic valve is, is regurgitant, leaky, or narrowed, um, typically pulmonary hypertension would develop only when the left ventricle fails. So the squeezing function is, of the left ventricle is affected by the problems with the aortic valve. Um, those, the, the, how you address pulmonary hypertension in those situations really depend upon what the recommended intervention is for the valve. Sometimes the valve can be repaired percutaneously without doing surgery. Sometimes you have to do surgery. Uh, sometimes um, surgery is not recommended. So it really depends upon the valve, and that's going to drive what the recommended therapies are. Um, moving on to the lungs. Well, if you have scarring in the lungs, uh, one of the big questions, and I imagine this was, was what the clinical conundrum case was before, is what degree of fibrosis, the extent of scarring in the lungs, is too much? What level? of fibrosis in the lung is, is going to be too much for these medications to be effective. So why would it be these medications wouldn't, wouldn't be effective? Well, these medications for pulmonary hypertension all work by dilating the blood vessels in the lungs. Well, um, the lungs, when we were designed, he or she was pretty smart and basically designed the lungs to react to level, low levels of oxygen in a certain way. So if the lungs are damaged and parts of the lungs don't receive normal levels of oxygen, the blood vessels in that area constrict. It makes sense. You don't want to send oxygen that you're breathing in to areas of a lung that don't work. Right? Your, body, your body's smart. It knows that. 
The problem with that is that when, that when those blood vessels constrict, it raises the pressures in the lungs. So you can have pulmonary hypertension just from having low oxygen levels. Right? So that's another reason why wearing supplemental oxygen, if it's recommended, is so important because that can influence the pulmonary pressures, the pressures in your lungs. But anyway, these medications that are designed to treat pulmonary hypertension, they can't distinguish between areas of a lung that work and areas of a lung that don't work. So if you give someone who has significant interstitial lung disease pulmonary vasodilator therapy like Rivadio or Adcirc or whatever drug is out there, you're going to send increased amounts of blood to areas of a lung that don't work. And what is likely to happen? Your oxygen levels that are delivered, the oxygen levels in the rest of your body will drop because you're sending blood to areas of a lung that don't work. So that's the risk of giving somebody who has fibrotic lung disease pulmonary vasodilators. There has to be some way to figure out the threshold, what proportion of the lung is involved, above which or greater than which they won't, you won't respond to therapy, and we haven't figured that out. That's one of the big questions. Um, COPD, so emphysema, COPD, it's just a, it's usually a smoking-related lung disease. That can also lead to pulmonary hypertension. Sometimes we see it in our connective tissue disease patients. The same type of issues occur where the lungs aren't working well, you're sending increased blood to parts of the lung that don't work well, oxygen levels drop, it can make symptoms worse and pulmonary hypertension worse. Sleep apnea, we mentioned that. That's very important to treat. I, I pretty, um, I don't want to say strict, but I'm pretty vociferously, I'm a vociferous advocate for sleep studies in my patients um, because I know it's, 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 a, it's a tough thing to do and I, I can't imagine what it would feel like to wear a, a CPAP machine, but it is so important for the treatment of pulmonary hypertension. And for many people, if they're able to tolerate it, their symptoms improve so much that they uh, often will, will tolerate the the uh, uncomfortable mask for uh, every night because they know during the day they're going to feel better. I think the impact on someone's symptoms and the, the effectiveness of the medications is greatly enhanced with, with uh, treatment for sleep apnea. So sleep apnea is a very important thing. And what's, um, I think that's about it for lung disease. So then group four or, or chronic thromboembolic disease, as Colleen mentioned, is, is, is a significant cause of pulmonary hypertension in the connective tissue disease population. We see it most commonly in patients with lupus, but more and more we're seeing it in kind of a, 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 a mixed population of patients with connective tissue disease where they have scleroderma, some interstitial lung disease, and then some, some blood clots. 95% of the time, if you have a blood clot, it goes away. 95, 96% of the time. 4% of the time, it doesn't. And when it doesn't go away, no matter where that blood clot was, if the blood clot was on the right side of your, of your lungs and your left side didn't have any evidence of blood clot, unfortunately there's a reaction that can occur in your body that leads to blockaging, uh, blockages on both sides of the, of the lungs. So um, you can develop pulmonary hypertension from that. It's very important to be evaluated for that. That's why the ventilation perfusion scan is so important. The CAT scan is great. The CTA, um, the CT angiogram looking for blood clots is very good for detecting recent blood clots, not as good for detecting old blood clots. That's why we do both. If, you're, if you have a normal ventilation perfusion scan, it's nearly 100% negative predictive value, which means that if you have a normal VQ scan, you don't have CTEF, chronic thromboembolic disease. Okay, so it's, uh, the, the VQ scan is very important in that evaluation. Um, group five, we talked about renal disease and how that might impact um, the, the, the development of pulmonary hypertension. Uh, treating the underlying renal disease is um, important and may help with the treatment of pulmonary hypertension. Okay, so let's talk about, a couple minutes, let's talk about the therapies that are available. So um, recently there have been uh, a couple studies that have described treatment, different treatment strategies for pulmonary arterial hypertension. Uh, I'll tell you back 20 years ago when we first started treating pulmonary arterial hypertension, um, the initial drug that was studied was Flolan, and that was studied initially in patients who had idiopathic PAH. So scleroderma patients were not included in the initial studies, but there was a study that, was included, that only included patients with connective tissue diseases following that initial study in idiopathic PAH patients. And while the, the results weren't the same, 
okay? The, the, the initial study in, in the idiopathic patients was a short study, 12-week study, but there was a survival benefit seen in 12 weeks, okay? That wasn't demonstrated in the scleroderma population, in the connective tissue disease population, but symptoms improve, hemodynamics improve, and the uh, six-minute walk distance markedly improved in those patients. In the other drugs that were studied, um, we have less information. One of the problems with our field is that we tend to put all the connective tissue disease patients together. We just told you that they're very different. And actually, pulmonary hypertension is different in each of the respective connective tissue diseases. So lumping them together and saying that the response to a particular drug should be uniform across patients with connective tissue diseases is probably not right. Um, so recently, um, uh, we, we actually at our center conducted, and with uh, other centers across the country, conducted a study just in scleroderma patients who had just been, who had recently been diagnosed with PAH. And we put them on uh, initial combination therapy with um, a PDE5 inhibitor and an endothelial receptor antagonist. And what we found at 36 weeks was a marked improvement in their heart function. We had cardiac MRI, we were using at baseline, and then at follow-up, along with uh, right heart catheterization. And every measure that we looked at improved in those patients. It was the first study to, to demonstrate improvement in scleroderma patients. So um, pretty exciting results from our perspective when we think about therapies and maybe how we should approach patients with scleroderma, because traditionally the thought has been that the response to these therapies isn't as robust in scleroderma patients or in any connective tissue disease patients. Now, while I said that our study was, was, uh, was exciting, I think also we have to think about what endpoints we're looking at. So patients with scleroderma, with lupus, with mixed connective tissue disease have different issues that impact how far they can walk. Right? If you have joint involvement or you have myositis, the distance you're able to walk isn't the same as someone who doesn't have those particular problems. The GI tract is involved in all of these connective tissue, tissue diseases, and we don't know about the drug absorption. Are you actually getting the same amount of drug in your system as you, as you would if you didn't have scleroderma or lupus or one of these connective tissue diseases? We don't know. So uh, you know, should we be looking at other measures to assess how someone responds to therapy? Right? Should it be based upon how you feel? Should it be based upon other measures that we haven't considered. So that's one of the limitations when we try to figure out which drugs should be used to treat patients with scleroderma is, or connective connect tissue diseases in general. What endpoints should we be looking at? What, what, what can we expect? Um, so I will stop there and, and uh, because I want to give you time to ask some questions about, specific questions about therapies um, and any other questions you have regarding the presentation today so far. And just out of curiosity, how many masks ballpark are there for sleep apnea? Because I've tried 16 and none of them, none of them work. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea how many masks there are, uh, but 16 sounds, sounds like a lot. That's more than I would have guessed. Yeah. 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 Did you try That's... nasal pillows? Yeah. And that didn't work for you? Uh, too dry, yeah. Uh, it's tough. Yeah. Well, I would say you, get, you gave it a, a, a good shot. <laughs> well, I know your doctor, and she's going to keep pushing, so. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, um, you keep mentioning the VQ scan. Uh -huh. Okay, is that similar? Because I've never heard anybody actually um, explain what it was, so is it similar to um, a CAT scan, or what does it look like, and what, is, what type of device? Sure, so this? good question. We have one up here if you want to go. <laughs> <laughs> Just go. So what they do is they give you a radioactive tracer that then looks at the absorption in the lungs, and they take pictures through a ch like a regular chest x-ray type. Uh, and then they look at the perfusion, meaning the blood flow through the lungs. And when we see a discrepancy between the ventilation, the, how much 
um, air you're inhaling throughout the lungs and the perfusion, the, the blood flow, if there's kind of a, uh, what we call a mismatch or kind of a blockage, then that clues us in that there may be a clot there. And we look for multiple areas of clots for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. So if you haven't had one or don't remember having one, I would just ask your doctor uh, or provider about um, whether or not you had a VQ scan because as is mentioned, it's really essential to make sure that there aren't chronic clots there. I was wondering about collagen, if that's contraindicated, since the, you had talked about this being inflamed collagen in your system. And also, could you talk about the new treatments? You said there was a uh, phase three study. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure I understand the first part of your question, collagen, like collagen injections? Well, collagen uh, supplements. Oh. Uh, I've read about that recently, so I was wondering if that's contraindicated. You know, I, I have no idea. I don't know if you have any. I, I yeah. haven't heard about that. I haven't no. heard of, of collagen supplements. Uh, you know, any, any kind of supplements. I'm sure you've heard this at other sessions. The likelihood that it's, it's been studied in patients with pulmonary hypertension is so low, so none of us can recommend whether it's safe or not. So anything from vitamins to nutritional supplements, we're not going to be able to say whether it's safe or not because the studies just haven't been done. The other thing to think to, to, to be aware of is all the, the supplements that are out there on the market and your GNCs, wherever you go, whole, food, whole Foods, none of that is regulated by the FDA. So they say this is in this pill, but no one's ever checked to see the components are actually there. So you have no idea what you're getting. So you, you can believe them. They say there's 20 milligrams of echinacea in this, or it could be 20 milligrams of sodium. Yeah, there, there's, there's, no, there's no regulation. So I, I just caution patients, because I know patients are very interested in taking nutritional supplements, but knowing what's in the supplement, I can't, I can't tell you. So I don't know if it's safe or not. The, we don't know. Yeah. Ne ne nothing's ne ne regulated. Nothing's so. regulated. The lobby is very good. To, yeah. The lobby for the, for the nutritional supplements is very strong and doesn't allow the mm -hmm. FDA to go in and regulate it. So we have no idea what's in it. It's like, this, it's like sushi, right? You heard of the story about the medical students in New York who went and looked for sushi and they went and genetically typed the fish that were said to be tuna and whatever and it was wrong 75% of the time. You're mostly you're eating white fish. You think you're eating, you know, sea urchin. But, uh, yes? Yes, I, uh, for a short time after I was diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension, had uh, a doctor that had put me on Imuran to suppress the uh, autoimmune stuff going on and basically decided that the, the cons at that point and what effects I was having, you know, I made the choice to go off of it. Mm -hmm. But I've now got a new rheumatologist who recently did a CT scan, CT scan of my lungs, said there has been a little bit of additional scarring, but it's nothing, you know, that's huge from the previous one, but so she said, let's not do anything at this point. So I guess in general, I'll use that term again, so you'll be good. But at what level, I guess, would the alarm start going off that, you know, you really need to go on some sort of suppressant kind of medication because the pros outweigh the cons, even though there are some cons involved. So that's going to be an individual um, it's going to differ for each individual, so I don't want to speak specifically about your case. But in general, we look for changes in symptoms, imaging, and lung function. Okay, so we'll, you'll follow breathing tests over time, and if your total lung capacity or force of vital capacity, two measurements of how essentially how big the lungs are, if they drop more than the inherent variability within the study, then we think maybe you should go on therapy. The issues are any of these immunosuppressive therapies have side effects. And do those side effects and the likelihood of having those side effects outweigh the benefit, potential benefit? That's the question. Um, so I, I, I think it's, it's, it's really an individualized um, uh, answer and really depends upon conversation with, with your pulmonologist and rheumatologist. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I have rheumatoid arthritis as well as the pulmonary hypertension and I'm taking the Plaquenil and uh, steroid right now, mm -hmm. and I take the Lateris and at Circa. And I've been talking with my rheumatologist about some other medicines that you see things advertised, things that may help. 
And what I'm uh, wanting to know is, are there really are there drugs that are effective for the room, for the rheumatoid arthritis that will work against the uh, pulmonary hypertension drugs? And some things I asked her about, she's like, oh, I don't think they're going to work well together. And are there drugs out there that's going to actually make my, my pH worse? Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's a very good question, and there are, there are specific drug-drug interactions that vary between the particular immunosuppressive agents that are out there and your, your pulmonary hypertension medication, so that's a very important thing to ask your doctor, and it's a very simple thing for, for one of us uh, uh, to look up. So that, that, that's a good, uh, a good question. The other thing is side effects you might not necessarily think about that could affect the effectiveness of your medications include GI upset. So the uh, Celsept, which is a commonly used to treat uh, inflammatory diseases, lung disease, myositis, um, that usually people get really upset stomachs uh, and have diarrhea. And could that affect how much of the Lateris you're absorbing? Yeah. Um, what is the impact of that? We don't know. But these are types of things to, to keep in mind. Uh, anytime you have a, a problem with your bowels and you're taking a pill, you have to think about, am I really absorbing this medication? I think we have time How about things here. like such as like turmeric in capsule form that for an, an inflammation, does that really work? N no data. Um, I love turmeric, so, you know, personally, uh, but, uh, you know, whether it does anything, uh, I don't think there's been a, there's not been a clinical study that has looked at that particular aspect in pulmonary hypertension. Um, but, uh, I do like Indian food, so. Um, you talked about the ERA PD-5 combo therapy. Is there any information with scleroderma and the prostacyclin therapies? So there's one study um, from the IV, uh, the initial study of Flowland. Um, data from the newer prostanoid therapy, um, you know, the oral agents and the inhaled agents. Um, I think there was some for inhaled triprostanol, right? Uh, for, I think uh, from the Triumph study, there was a subgroup yeah. analysis of the connective tissue disease patients. It wasn't broken down between scleroderma, lupus, yeah. and other forms of connective tissue disease. I think it was all lumped together. And it looked to be a similar kind of benefit in terms of the magnitude of improvement in walk distance. Not, this, not as much, not as robust, but similar. Um, the data from the Selexapag has not been published yet, so I don't know if I can comment on that. Um, Arenatram, I'm not sure that it was, that it was uh, looked at. I don't think it, Yeah, I don't, I, I don't think that's been published either. Now. So I don't think we know um, yet. One more question. I was just wondering if the collagen overproduction with scleroderma mm -hmm. is what causes the problems and shutting down the arteries and the veins, whatever. Why we always been told that if you put collagen on yourself, you'll be eternally young and ever. Why, if we have overproduction of collagen, don't we look like we're 20? <laughs> it's like, well, I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I think uh, the, the, the scleroderma involvement sometimes, you know, leads to tightening of the skin, right, in the face. I mean, a lot of, a lot of, uh, no, not yours. <laughs> On the inside, okay. <laughs> all right. Well, I'd like to thank you all for coming, and we'll, we'll stay up here for, for a couple minutes if anyone has some questions they'd like to ask us. Appreciate your attendance.